So I added my own. One of my favorite uh, paradoxes, right? I always lie. I'm lying. If there's any old Star Trek fans, there was an episode where yeah, there you go. There's an episode where they're androids and they wanted to freak them out, so they said he always lies, and then he said I'm lying, and the android went shit. <laughs> Right. So I'm glad that I normally when I say something like that, it's only me. So not only. Or you're just humoring me, which is a really good idea. <laughs> oh, before I get in there, I think there was at least one question from the homework. Homework. So if you want to ask questions on something that wasn't on the quiz, that would be like three, 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 four, three, five. It was uh, 3.4. It was page 260, number 16. So on page 260, number 16. <laughs> So, you guys help me out. Can you, oh, all right, good. Can you list all the possible rational zeros? What would they be made of? Uh, one, three, nine, uh, nine, three, uh, All right, let's do it a little more systematic. We've got plus or minus what on the top? Good, one, three, nine. Because it's going to be all the factors of this last two, right? And all the ratios that those make with the factors of uh, one third. this dude. So I don't think we've actually officially done this yet, but let's try to list out what these numbers are. So 1 divided by 1, there's a plus or minus for everybody. 3 divided by 1, 9 divided by 1. OK, that's exciting. Uh, then we do 1 divided by 3. 3 divided by 3 I already have. 9 divided by 3 I already have. Success, right? And then there you go. So the only the really uh, different thing it adds is that possibility of being one third. Cool. Plus or minus. So there's the list that I have to check out. Can anybody tell me something nice? Because it's a cube, I know I can't group this thing. You can see pretty quickly that there's no way that the grouping would work. But because it's a cube, why is that kind of nice about how much synthetic division I'm going to have to do? One. I'm only have to do it once because then I'll have a quadratic, which either will be factorable or I can attack it with quadratic formula, right? You guys still mind with me? Yeah. There's only one thing. So I really only have to get one synthetic division to work, and then I can attack it with quadratic formula. Real quick, can somebody remind me, what would Descartes say about this? One change. Yeah, there's one change, so there's one positive. Zero. Yeah, so that's going to really upset a lot. So there's a, uh, Descartes would say, one change in Px, so there's one positive real root. That's kind of nice. And if I did P of negative x, that would be negative 3x cubed. You guys remember the shortcut on P of negative x? Yeah. Which ones change sign? Which ones? All the positive powers. All the odd powers, powers change sign, right? right? All the even ones are just going to eat that negative up. Okay. So this is going to change. And of course, the constant stays the same. How many changes are there there? One, two, three, two. 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 So there are going to be how many negative real roots? Two. 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 Or zero. Or zero. Or zero. Because they might be two negative real roots, or they could be uh, two complex roots. The really nice thing about this, though, is I know that there is exactly one positive root. So it might be a good idea to start there. Now, some of you guys who are gamblers say, well, if there are two roots, two negative roots, I have a twice the chance to find it, but you also have a chance that there are none. I don't know, so it depends on how 
lucky you feel? I don't know. Let's start with the real, the positive ones. That's what I would do. Who wants to, what do you, should we try, start? Three, three, three. Three? three. Mm -hmm. Is there a reason for that? It's in the middle. Probably work. I like Because then we might be able to use what? It's not, it's not really, though. if you use one, it might be over. I gotta use the upper bound theorem, possibly. Yeah. Uh, so then three comes down. What kind of tells me? Can you guys see anything about this that tells me this is maybe not a great idea? Because these are all positive, and so is it. So it's gonna grow and grow. Can you see that? Yeah. One third. So I mean, you start to notice things like that. Negative three. Do negative three. All right. Negative three sounds like it might be better based on what we just talked about, right? Yeah. So three times that, add, multiply, add, multiply, see that? That looks good. So there's all these little side things that are almost impossible for me to teach because they just come out from you observing patterns and, and starting to cut things down. Don't go all the way through a synthetic division. There should be a point where you go, this ain't going to work. Screw it. Or maybe it's going to be an upper bound, so maybe you do want to finish it out. So what do I know so far? P of x is x plus 3. You think this might factor here? Yeah. Yeah. Yes. All right. So x plus 3. It's got to be 3x and x. Now, it's just the question of do I put a 3 here or a 3 there? And to get 8, I need a 9 somewhere, don't I? So the 3's got to go with the 3 there somehow, right? So now the question is, what's minus, what's plus? I want the 9 to be positive, and the other one's got to be negative to bring it back down to 8. Or whatever method you use to factor something like that. That's sort of what I do, roughly. Yeah. <coughs> On the top of that question, it asks, um, find all real zeros of p. Oh, yeah, we're there. We're there now, aren't we? Uh, what are the zeros? Um, negative x three. minus 3. Negative 3? One third? Oh. And then I have a repeated negative 3. <laughs> so does that agree with what Descartes predicted? Yeah. Even yeah. though he's semi-lame, he says, there will definitely be 2 or maybe 0. <laughs> Right, but you see, Descartes, yeah, there were two negative real roots, and there was exactly one positive root. Yes. Can you explain how the uh, x, 3x minus 1 is zero? Oh, um, why is x plus 3 negative 3? Because you set it equal, you set each one of these equal to 0 to find the zeros, right? So if you set 3x minus 1 equal to 0, add 1 divided by 3. And that kind of explains why this should lead to the possibility of rational roots. Because anytime I have a number out front like this, it is going to have a piece that could be 3x and 1 or something. It's going to give you a fractional answer. All right, cool, cool. How's that? Is that decent? Yeah. All right. I don't want to play poker with most of you. <laughs> yes. Okay. <laughs> no way. You don't need any glasses. Just leave. Um, <coughs> any other questions or homework? Just to remind you guys, last time we did make it through 3-6. Believe it or not. So what is the oh, test yeah. going to go through? Oh, here's the thing about the test. I'm glad you said it. I know I think I said I wouldn't move a test, but I'm going to move this Test to move to the following Monday. So it was supposed to be next Wednesday, uh, which would have been the 26th? Yeah. 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 So now it's going to be the 24th. 30th days of September, so October 1st, right? Yeah. 30 days. Oh, yeah, because we're talking about first. Yeah, that was really nice. Thank you. Yes. <laughs> I always get mixed reactions to that. Is that understood? Yeah. Are you going to add more things to the test? 
Yes, it's a trade-off. <laughs> then there's related reactions. But it's not going to be added to what's already on there. I don't think we're going to quite make it to chapter four. So it's going to be on whatever we manage to cover uh, by next class. Could we have like from 2.7 up to however far we make it in chapter four. Sweet. Second. Yep, we'll be reviewing a week from today. We'll be reviewing. So on Monday, I'll have the practice test for you. Wednesday will be review day. I'll have the answer key. The following Monday will be the test. Yeah, cool. It all sort of makes sense somehow. And just to make sure, I, I got a few confused looks. Chapter 3 really gets detailed. It, it talks about all this uh, synthetic division to find all the roots and the factor, everything. And then, it's, and then it says, oh, here's complex numbers. And then the next section is, okay, do everything you just did before, except now some complex numbers might come up. So section 3.6, this is what I said last time, is almost like a review section because it's the same process. It's just that, ooh, you might get some I in there, right? 3I plus 2 or something might come up. You guys with me here? Yeah. Yeah. Face has got to come on. It's a little scary. All right. So there's no other questions on stuff up to 3.6. I'm going to get into 3.7. Can the calculator do this with imaginary number? Actually, yeah. There is a setting in your calculator for complex numbers. Uh -huh. This might be motivation to go look it up <laughs> or to look in your manual. It's pretty sad. It's like a little setting on somewhere on your calculator. <laughs> so somebody remind me, we did, oh good. It always runs out of power, so I'm going to have to keep it over there from now on. Somebody remind me, we, we talked a little bit about the function 1 over x. Does anybody remember what context I brought that up in? What was funky about the function 1 over x? It's its own inverse. Cool. It's its own inverse. So one thing we talked about before was if this is true, then f inverse is still that. And it only makes sense. What's the opposite of flipping something? Flipping it back so it's its own inverse. <coughs> so we're going to get a lot more detail with this function and related functions. What kind of function is this? It makes a ratio, so it's a rational function. Cool. All right, so it's a ratio of polynomials. Very basic polynomial up here, but still. So this is a rational function. Um, what's the main thing, what's the main difference between polynomials and rational functions? What do rational functions have a problem with that polynomials definitely don't? Domain. domain. Rational functions, domains might be less than all real numbers. In this case, what's, what can x not be? Zero. zero. Can't be zero. Can divide by zero. That means visually, we, we looked at the graph of this also, because when we talked about it being its own inverse, that had to mean something funky about its symmetry, right? Because how is an inverse and a function, how are they related visually? Yeah, it's flipped across the y equals x-axis. So this, if it's its own inverse, it has to already be symmetric to the y equals x-axis. You with me? Semi with me. All right. So what does this thing look like? Let, let's make a little table of values just to get into this. Nothing major here, right? When you plug a negative two in, you get one half. 
Negative one half. Plug in negative one. Negative one. Plug in a negative one half. Negative two. Plug in a negative one tenth. Negative ten. Right, because it's just going to flip it, right? That's what that function does. It just flips things. So very big things become very small. Very small things become very big. Cool. Zero, undefined. One tenth, ten. Now we should have to do any more because what is it going to do? Just repeat that for the positive ones. Cool. Okay. All right. So how's that? That by itself shouldn't be that big of a deal. Okay. Um, so how's this graph going to look then? So we have uh, negative one, negative two. So a negative two is negative one half. Look, Jeff, you can do it. There you go. Negative one half. Negative two. Negative two. At negative one, it was negative one. At negative one half, it was negative two. And at negative one tenth, it was negative ten. So on this side, it looks like this. Yeah, Jeff. Woohoo! Are we doing so far? Deal with my horrible attempt at drawing a curve line. And it's going to be the same thing over there, except, of course, all the positive inputs will result in positive outputs. So it's going to be the same look here. One tenth is going to be ten. One half is going to be two. One is uh, one. Uh, well, so we have two is one half. So forth. So it's going to be the same look here. And somebody gave away a little bit. Asymptotes, right? How many asymptotes are up here? One. Two. Two. There's this one here. Because can this ever go to zero? The only way a fraction can be zero is if the top is zero, and this top is always one. But we can say this. As x goes to infinity, y goes to zero. Now just think about that for a second. Is that one, as x gets really, really big, what do the outputs do? They get really, really small. So if you could get to infinity, but you can't, then the outputs would be zero there. Okay. And there can't be an infinity location because then what is it if you take one more step? I don't know what that is. So you can't get there. But it, that's where it's headed is what that's trying to say. So this is related to something called, uh, has anybody ever heard, I don't think I've said this yet, Zeno's Paradox? No. Anybody ever heard of that? So me, I was a real smart ass. <laughs> yeah. well, I was still um, And my instructor told us about Zeno's Paradox. And he said, OK, Zeno wants to get to that town over there. But he's got to cover half the distance to the town first. Right? So that town is the wall there. And then he's got to cover half the distance of what's left. And then he's got to cover half the distance of what's left, and then half of that, and then half of that. Is he ever going to get there? And everybody says, no. And I said, well, just lie to him. Tell him the town is twice as far away as it really is. He's there on the first freaking trip then. <laughs> <laughs> he didn't like that. <laughs> but, I mean, that's sort of like this. It's always cutting the distance down and down and down, but it's always going to be some positive distance away. Stupid small distance eventually, but that's what an asymptote is all about. It's gets closer and closer, but never quite get there. And where's the other asymptote? I said there were two. This one. Right? As x goes to 0, well, this, of course, this works in the other direction too, right? As x goes to negative infinity, y still goes to 0. But what happens as x goes to 0? Yeah, here's the place. Can you see why I need to have a better way to say this? And I'm not going to be, I'm not going to get real detailed with the symbols, but they do show you these symbols in the book. So I want to explain what these mean. And anybody going into calculus, within the first three weeks, you'll see these exact symbols. So I saw a few people kind of perk up there. Um, why can't I just say as x goes to 0, y does something for sure? Because doesn't it depend? What's y doing here? 
going to positive infinity. What's y doing here? Going to negative infinity. Going to negative infinity. So I have to have a way of saying either one. So I can say as x goes to 0 from above, from above, the y's are going to positive infinity. So I'm going to say as x goes to 0 from below, yeah. y goes to negative infinity. Cool. That's actually a way of writing it because we put a plus or Exactly. So from the from the right is this, or from above, from the left or from below is a negative sign. Cool. So it doesn't have to be negative values. You could actually be up here and coming from below, it would still be a negative symbol. It just means coming from below. Okay, cool. For this class, these symbols are not the most useful. But in calculus, you almost can't do some of the stuff in there without using these kind of symbols to help you describe things. OK, so is everybody semi-decent with that? So in case you see these in the book, that's all they need. Okay. Uh, let's see, anything else you can say about this? Who could tell me what this would do? Beautiful. The 2 is with the x. So which way would it shift? Good. Back 2. So it's going to have the same exact shape. Just move left. So what asymptote would you use? Exactly. The y axis. So now where is the vertical asymptote going to be? Yeah, the vertical asymptote has got to get up and move over, move back twice. Because this whole thing has to move over twice. What can x not be now? Negative, Negative two. 2. So here's the cool thing. I want to get the terminology I use in right now. I would say there's a wall at negative 2. Because it's pretty damn strong. It says you cannot be here. So what does it normally do? It runs up against the wall and goes, oh, crap. Well, it's a trap. Yes, no? Not really? Right. <laughs> References. Um, so negative 2, here's where the wall is going to be there. So that is a, you cannot go through that wall, period. Because if you did, if you did draw through it, that means that somehow there's a function output for that input, and there ain't no way. It's undefined there. So the least you could do is have an open circle somewhere, to be honest. It could do this. Open circle, <laughs> right? And I'll show you when it does that, because that's kind of a freaky thing that comes out of nowhere. Most of the time, it's going to just run up against it, either up and down, or both up like that. Of course, we know what this is going to do, because it's the same function, just been shifted over twice. So it's going to still have this shape here, like this, like this. Is that cool? Yeah. What is this y-intercept? One half. Uh, uh, one half. You make x zero, you get one half. So that's one half. Cool. Okay. So it's allowed to go through that y-axis now, because you can make x zero. Okay, how are we feeling so far? So do you see a generalization we can make if I start throwing more and more complicated? These are easy. These are simple rational expressions because it's at most linear. Hell, the top is a freaking constant, right? That's pretty simple. I can start throwing second, third, fourth degree things on the top and the bottom, but what can I say about this vertical asymptote? What, what generalization can I make? If I throw this at us, can somebody figure out where the um, wall or walls are going to be? Um, what do you want to say? I don't know. Uh, sure. No, Jeff, that won't work. Uh, there, that one. Yeah, so the asymptote, where does, where does a vertical asymptote come from then always? The x values that make the bottom zero. Let's say it a little different. Vertical asymptotes 
come from those x values that cannot be used, right? So vertical asymptotes come from the domain. Mm -hmm. More specifically, the restricted values. Okay, cool. So far, so decent. Of course, some of you guys might realize we're spending a lot of time right now on vertical asymptotes. I'm going to then probably go into what about general horizontal asymptotes. We haven't talked about that guy yet. How can they be different? So let's kind of look at this guy. How would I determine then the vertical asymptotes? Cool. Back to that bottom. And how's it factor? Oops. Yeah, x minus 6, x minus 4. So then there's going to be a wall, there's going to be a vertical asymptote at Cool. And actually, some of you guys might realize those are the equations of the vertical asymptotes. And x equals something is a vertical line. Right? So they ask you for the equation of the vertical asymptote. It's nothing major. Just say x equals something, you got it. Right? What can x not be? That's where the vertical asymptote is. So I can right now place <coughs> walls at Good job. <laughs> <laughs> I can right now place walls at four and six. So this thing, what could this possibly do then? I mean, on this side, it's going to either run up this way or it's going to run down that way, right? You with me? This one be negative four and negative six. No, it won't because if you set this equal to zero, yeah. yeah. So what could this look like? And tell me this, what are the x-intercepts of this thing? Let's look at that at the same time. What are the x-intercepts? How do you make this function equal to 0? How do you make a rational expression equal to 0? Make the top 0. Can I make the top 0? Are there any x-intercepts? None. I have no control over the top. There's no x variables up there. I have no control up there. So I can't make it zero. That would just make it undefined. It would actually make it infinite. Right? The bigger, uh, the smaller the bottom gets, the bigger the whole thing gets. And that's actually why it blows up like that. It becomes infinite. Some guys might realize that. Another name for undefined is infinite. And that's why. If you divide by smaller, smaller, you get bigger, bigger. So if you divide by zero, you get the biggest that you can get. Infinity. So what could this look like? Why couldn't it look like this? Exactly. It goes to the x-axis. There are no doors through the x-axis, right? There are no x-intercepts. So then more than likely, it either does this kind of thing or this kind of thing. You guys with me? In fact, think about it. What happens when x gets really big? What does y do as x gets really big? Or in this case, h of x. It goes to 0, right? When you put bigger and bigger x values in there, won't this bottom just become crazy big? Beautiful. So it does have to do this asymptotic at 0 thing. Either like this or like that. What could it do in here? Considering that there are no x-intercepts, what could it do? Be like this or like that? Guess what? Is it really cool the fact that I'm not drawing the graph of the function? I'm drawing the possibilities. If this was a function, then this could not be a function because it wouldn't pass for a line test. So I'm just drawing the possibilities right now. And of course, back here, it would be very similar to over here, right? It could either be up here or down there. Okay, 
technical. Yes. When I have a rational expression, what do I look at? How can I make um, a rational expression equal zero? So if I had x minus seven over this equal, how do I make it equal to zero? What's the only way a fraction can be equal to zero is if the top equals zero. So in this case, what would the x-intercept be? Seven. 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 Because I have control up there, right? Yeah. I can make it zero. Over here, the top, I don't care. Whatever I do, what's the top? It's one. One. So the top is like, ah, uh, that's nice. Doing all that stuff. And I don't care. It's just always one. So there's no way to make this thing equal to zero. You see my with me? So there's no x values that can make this thing equal to zero. In fact, the, the best it could do is to make it get close. When it makes x really, really big, it makes it close to zero, but it still never gets there. Right? And then the other example, x would be equal to seven. Yeah, here the x-intercept would be seven. Yeah. All right, so what I want to do is come in and do that one a little more specifically and see how we can tell which situation it is. Then I think we'll take a little break yeah. after we do that. <laughs> I don't know how you feel about that. And uh, then we'll come back and keep going. So let's look at this a little more closely. Ah, oh, there we go. So we already know that there's horizontal asymptotes at, no, that hurts. Vertical asymptotes at six and four. We've got the possibilities down. Can anybody? And there's no ver there's no x-intercepts to kind of help me out with this. Can anybody give me an idea of how I can determine where this thing really is in each of those regions? So my my vertical asymptotes kind of break this thing up. Else that we get. We'll see. So I have kind of this region, this middle region, and that region out there. Depending on what polynomial sign of it, if it's or negative. Yeah, cool. So if it's if I plug in like zero and I get a positive value, then it must exist up here. There's no way it could be down here because there's no intercept to let it go through. That's why I call intercepts doors. They let you go through the axis, right? There is no door. So the minute I know it's over here, then it must always be up there in that region. Because there's no way for it to go through that. And it can't just go transport. It can't just suddenly go down there, right? So I can find the y-intercept. That's a really good idea. This region contains x equals 0. What do you get when you plug a 0 in? 1 over 24. 1 over 24, which is positive. That's really all that matters. So now it's going to be like that. Now this is a very rough sketch. If I wanted to make a little bit nicer sketch, I would plug in three maybe to see how far up it's gotten, right? Yes, ma'am. So when we plug a zero in, that's zero, that's zero, so I get one over 24. The really important thing about that, if I want just a rough sketch, is that it's positive. Is there any way that the function can be down here then? Because it's here at zero, there's nowhere for it to go through. So it's got to all be up here. Cool. All right. How are we doing so far? So the same thing here. What do you get when you plug a 5 in? 25 minus 50. Negative 25 plus 24 is negative 1. Negative 1. You get negative 1. That's nice. So then it must be like. It's got to be like this. You guys cool with the fact that it's just, ha there's no other thing it could be. Now, the one little thing you could quibble about is that might not be the highest point. You with me? It doesn't have to be symmetric in there. But that's probably close to the freaking highest point. The thing I know for sure is there ain't no way it can go through that x-axis because, again, there's no x-intercepts. There's no way for it to go through. What would you plug in to get that? Five. Uh -oh. Yep. So we plug a five in, we got the 25 and 24, 49 minus 50. 
negative one. Cool. And then to finish it out, if you plug a 7 in, you'll get 49 uh, plus 24 is 73 minus 70 is 3. So you get one third. So it's going to be like that. Let's put a turn there. I've got it broken up into regions. I don't have any x-intercepts. I love x-intercepts because they kind of are what I call anchors. They tell me for sure when I function. I don't have any of those. Crap. The good thing about not having any x-intercepts is I know it's going to exist either totally on one side or the other side. It can't possibly go through. So all i got to do is in this whole region here, if I just plug in one thing and plugging zero in is the easiest thing. If it's positive, it's all up here. If it's negative, it's all down there. To make it a more precise graph, I can just plug in a few more points. But to make a rough sketch, I just need one point. I know if it's on top or if it's down below. Okay. Are we doing so far with that? And then you just keep going. I've got three regions here. If I have two vertical asymptotes, I have one, two, three regions. I just have to check each one of them out. All right, maybe. Both faces are replaced by a loop of concern. <laughs> Is there ever a point where it would cross through? Oh, yeah, let's do one like that. Oh, actually, let me stick my work. Take a break. Then we'll do one like that. Come back, uh, five till. <laughs> Is that all right? <laughs> 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 Professor Waller, how did you get H two O seven?